G'day guys, welcome back to True Footy. It is well and truly trade season, baby. Uh, hence, a lot of the trade content is gonna start to take over on the channel a little bit. And uh, obviously, I have yesterday given you my sort of trade predictions, giving you a little bit of a snapshot as to what to expect in this upcoming trade period, as well as my own personal thoughts, obviously. Already had one kind of proven wrong. Todd Goldstein to the pies uh, doesn't look like it's happening. Apparently, he's requested a trade to Essendon. That being said, uh, if you wanna keep up with what's going ahead in this trade period, check out that video and obviously subscribe the channel if you haven't already for more ongoing trade content. So today's video is going to be more of a retrospective look back at last year's trade period and making a bit of a early uh, sort of estimation of how those trades went ahead. Of course, in this video, we'll just be talking about the players that switch clubs and not so much about all the pick swaps and stuff like that. We're kind of assessing what impact each of the players that got traded last year had on their respective sides in 2022. And obviously, it's too early to really make an assessment on all of these players, but nonetheless, we're going to discuss exactly how they went in their first season at their new club. So the way I formatted this video to make it kind of uh, cohesive is I've sort of grouped all the, the players uh, that went to one club into one club, if that makes sense. So for instance, um, first of all, I'm going to be talking about Collingwood. I'm going to group all four players that they recruited last year in Bobby Hill, McStay, Tom Mitchell, and Billy Frampton. Generally, we'll start with some of the bigger deals and then on towards the end of the video, we'll start to move off to the, some of the smaller deals that happened last year and make a bit of an assessment. Okay, so like I mentioned, uh, first of all, we're gonna talk about the four players that joined Collingwood last year, and this is arguably the most successful. Uh, we had three premiership players out of the batch that joined Collingwood in Bobby Hill, Tom Mitchell, and of course, Billy Frampton, with Dan McStay just missing out, making it all the way to the prelim, and then of course, suffering that uh, unfortunate injury. Although, of course, if he had stayed in the side, would Billy Frampton have come in? I'm not too sure. But nonetheless, that's an amazing haul. Obviously, uh, McStay, he came in as a free agent, so it didn't really cost anything in terms of draft collateral. He played uh, 14 games and kicked 20 goals, which is a solid return. As I've said in previous videos, I think McStay's value to Collingwood uh, is more structural than necessarily him being a ch uh, chance for the Coleman or anything like that. So 20 goals from 14 games is a modest but reasonable return. Then there's Tom Mitchell who played 26 games for Collingwood this year. And when you consider the cost traded to get uh, Tom Mitchell off of Hawthorne, it was basically 41 and 51 that left Collingwood that went to Hawthorne in exchange for Tom Mitchell. And like I said, the guy played every game. He's a premiership player. At different times was more of the forefront of their on-ball division and at other times sort of hung back but he still averaged 25 possessions. So another big win for Collingwood there. Bobby Hill, of course, arguably the biggest win. I think if you get recruited to a club and in the first season win a Norm Smith medal, it's hard to really beat that, to be honest, other than perhaps the Brownlow. But his obvious game-breaking performance in that grand final is going to be remembered for a long time. But on top of that, he just had a really good season as a small forward as well. 24 games he played this year, kicked 33 goals, and it came at the cost of of a future second round pick. So all of these players so far have come at a pretty moderate price as well. And there's Billy Frampton who came from Adelaide, drafted by Port Adelaide originally and now as a premiership player. He played 16 games, obviously played in the grand final and uh, for a future third round pick, he's well and truly been a pretty good value pickup. So the fact that Collingwood got in three premiership players and one player that probably should have played in the grand final had he been fit uh, and they still took a first round draft pick in Ed Allen. These are all wins for Collingwood. Of course, you know, assessing trades more goes into it in just their first season, but you could argue that they contributed to a premiership and therefore has validated the trade already because that's what football is all about, premierships. The next one is Tim Taranto and Jacob Hopper, grouping them together as they were, they were two separate trades from GWS and the total outgoings for, for them were 12, 19, 31 in last year's draft and Richmond's first round draft pick this year, which uh, off the top of my head would have been about pick six or seven. So a pretty reasonable price for those players, but we're really more focusing on what they added to Richmond in terms of their first season. I would say Taranto Taranto more or less delivered in a team that needed some midfield reinforcement. Taranto, he got 19 Brownlow votes, arguably could have had more. He had a pretty good impact. Um, by contrast, Hopper was less impactful, but it was still an okay season. He averaged 21 disposals and there were some injury concerns there, just managed the 16 games in 2023. But he is two years off his, uh, probably his best season in 2021. But of course, injury has played a factor in that. Now, of course, you can make some long-term uh, questions about what is the best outcome for Richmond in terms of these guys, you know, like they've traded out of two drafts effectively for Taranto and Hopper, which were meant to help in the medium term. But you could argue, I think these will also be important players in the transition of Richmond's list. So it remains to be seen whether it was a good move in the entire landscape of their rebuild. But at the moment, you'd say Tim Taranto in particular has been a successful recruit. And we'll talk about Jason Horn Francis and Junior Rioli joining Port Adelaide last off season. This was one big messy trade that involved, I think it was six clubs in the end. Uh, pick one went from North to GWS. 
progress. We won't get into all the messy mechanics of it. Essentially, what Port Adelaide gave up was pick eight last year and their future first, which would have been, God, I don't even know. Well, it's pick 14 or 15 currently that North hold, but it might get pushed back to about 19. Uh, and there were some swaps of seconds and thirds, and Rioli was more or less pick 40, I think the trade value was. So two first round picks uh, to get Horn Francis and Rioli. Uh, Horn Francis, I would argue, had a very successful season. Much was said of his three round vote performance uh, where we had 13 possessions. But, you know, I think when you assess a player like Jason Horn Francis, one thing that maybe gets lost is that he is a second year player. So I'd say the output of 17 disposals a game and 16 goals from 24 games, that's a very respectable result for a player that I think also needs to mature a little bit to play the role that he was really drafted for, which is a big bodied explosive midfielder forward. I think this guy's going to get better with maturity. And I'd say so far he has delivered on that promise. Junior Rioli also had a reasonable season, 31 goals uh, from 19 games. He had a couple of bags of four this year against the Cats and the Hawks. And I still think a play with immense potential. And I think he probably still hasn't quite delivered on that since he went to Port Adelaide. But 31 goals from 19 games is a very respectable season at the price they got him for. Josh Dunkley was another high profile trade last year. He was eventually traded... Uh, from the Bulldogs to the Brisbane Lions for pick 21 and a future first, second, and fourth. Dunkley was also traded alongside two future thirds as well. For the record, uh, those picks that the Bulldogs acquired got them Charlie Clark, and it also allowed them to get some points for Jordan Croft this year. So what I mean by that is that the Bulldogs hold Brisbane's pick 17 or 18, whatever it is currently. That is most likely going to get absorbed for a Jordan Croft bid, or they'll trade it to get more points or whatever. But Dunkley had a pretty successful season, you'd say. He played 24 games. He averaged 20 24 disposals and five clearances and he is still only 27 next year in a team that is well and truly going to be in the mix for a premiership uh, you know window for the next few years you'd say and the fact that he played in the grand final I'd say he's more or less delivered so far on what Brisbane wanted out of their first season from Josh Dunkley and uh, the fact that he's still got time there as well means that this trade still has some upside for them if they can jag a premiership then we'll talk about Fremantle's ins uh, they had a lot of outs this year as well or sorry going into this year but uh, I think we isolate the trades of Luke Jackson, Jay Gray Mira, and Josh Corbett. So first of all, Luke Jackson was another high profile trade from last year. He cost them pick 13 and a future first and a future second. Fremantle were well and truly poised to uh, make a big trade of this nature given, you know, first of all, Luke Jackson had just finished his third year at Melbourne, so still a, a long-term young prospect. And, you know, Fremantle had been investing in the draft plenty going into this year. It was, it was only 2019, they took three top 10 picks and then, you know, Luke Jackson joined them as another top three pick from that draft. But assessing his value in the first season, I'd say it was pretty, pretty successful, to be honest. He played 23 games and he kicked 22 goals, average 18 hitouts, and and uh, had 15 disposals a game. And for me, the query on Jackson was what position does he play? Well, whatever he's been doing this year is a sort of balanced uh, back backup ruck to Sean Darcy and also going forward and hitting the scoreboard with 22 goals. He certainly played a role. So I'd say it's a pretty successful first season for Luke Jackson. O'Meara was more or less recruited for two factors. Obviously, Hawthorne trying to shed some experience and uh, expose their younger midfield. So it worked for them. But for Fremantle, having lost a lot of experience in that midfield, you know, Akers, David Mundy, Darcy Tucker, amongst others probably, O'Meara comes in as a solid, mature clearance winner, and he had a reasonable season. 19 and a half disposals a game, 21 games he played, four and a half clearances, five tackles. So I'd say he's come in and been a solid role player for Fremantle. Is he going to be part of their premiership window? Well, it depends how fast their premiership window comes around. There's still a young list, but he is on the older end. I think he turns 29 next year, but if he can play a role in the short term, so far so good, I'd say for O'Meara. Corbett, on the other hand, was traded for a future fourth. He's played five games, he's 27 years old, and wow, well, I sounded Kiwi then. But his return of three goals from five games, um, nothing much to really report there. We wouldn't say it's an overly successful one, but he was traded for a future fourth, so who cares? Geelong were also in the thick of it last trade period. They got Jack Bowes, Tanner Braun, and Ollie Henry, and you know, just on the surface level, when you consider as well, they got pick seven in the trade for Jack Bowes. That was uh, wonderfully successful. But if we focus on the player's performance, Jack Bowes, you know, around some injury issues, had a solid first season without being spectacular. He played 17 games in their back line, uh, averaged about 15 disposals, had some pretty good games, but the one with more long-term upside, apart from the fact that they drafted Jai Clark with that pick seven or nine or whatever it became, Tanner Braun joined from GW West.
Jess. He's a young 21-year-old mid. Uh, was traded for pick 18 in the end and played 19 games, 16 disposals, and I think looms as a pretty important part of Geelong's midfield transition. So he's a player that's young enough that he can be part of the long-term future, and by extension as well, it's a little bit hard to assess him based on one season, but I'd say that's relatively successful. Ollie Henry also cost pick 25 roughly when you take out all the extra picks that were involved. It was roughly pick 25, and he actually had a really successful season, I would argue, with 22 games at the Cats and 41 goals. And considering he's 21 as well, and that there was a bag of four against the eventual Premier's Collingwood, you'd have to say, you know, that's a very successful haul, uh, potentially in the medium and long term for Geelong. Okay guys, before we continue with the rest of the video, I do have an important message to share with you. As you'd know, this year, True Footy has started working with the fantasy platform called Game Day Squad. And on behalf of Game Day Squad, I have something pretty awesome to share with you. And that is, if you haven't already, that they have just launched for AFLW. That means you can start fresh with a new squad and team and again, win weekly prizes. This is your chance to get ahead of the game and make a team for the start of the brand new season. So make sure you follow the link in the description to both creating a team on Game Day Squad and sign Signing up to the True Footy League, which is of course completely free. Let's transform women's fantasy Aussie rules into a sensational reality. Then we've got uh, the Melbourne Football Club who recruited Brody Grundy, Lockie Hunter and Josh Shackey. So uh, a bit of a mixed bag this one. Grundy did cost them pick 27 and uh, was sort of considered a potential dynamic duo with Max Gorn. Obviously didn't really pan out. So this hasn't been overly successful considering as well the fact that they're likely to give up on this experiment within one season, which I've talked about on this channel. But he played 17 games, for 21 hitouts a game, kicked 10 goals. And we know that he they wanted him to play forward and doesn't really want to play forward. Um, but the fact that they're giving up on this already sort of I think validates the suggestion that this one was a little bit of a flop. Um, by contrast, getting Lockie Hunter for a future third round pick from the Western Bulldogs, I'd say that was pretty successful. He played 24 games for 22 disposals a game. Melbourne just shoring up a bit of midfield depth. Obviously, we saw a few injuries to their midfield this year. Um, and then there was Shaki, who played three games this year, was traded for a future fourth. So being traded for a future fourth kind of indicates how likely it is you are going to succeed at your new club, I would argue. So not much to report on Josh Shaki there, but uh, over Overall, a mixed bag for Melbourne there. In more positive news, uh, Adelaide also recruited Isaac Rankin last year for what was essentially pick five and a swap of later picks. This guy has the potential to be one of the most electrifying small forwards in the competition. I love to watch him play, but if you look at his output, 36 goals from 20 games as a 23-year-old small forward, averaging 16 disposals a game, I think Adelaide would be very, very happy with that output, even though it was a steep price. He, along with the other talent they have in that forward line, has given Adelaide a potency in their forward line that is almost rivaling the team that made the grand final in 2017. So I'd say with the upside that Rankin has, this trade is looking very good for the Crows. Let's talk about Griffin Logue and Darcy Tucker, who were part of this priority pick assistance package that was given to North last year, where they were given two picks, a future second and a future third, that if they didn't trade for mature players, would be essentially deleted. So they had to trade players and essentially were given Griffin Logue and Darcy Tucker from Fremantle. Um, looking at them in isolation, Logue played 15 games. It's a bit of a shambles side. I think he's come in and probably added something. Probably extra validates it when you consider Ben Mackay is about to leave as well. But the unfortunate thing is that Griffin Logue did his ACL this year, which means he's probably going to miss maybe half of next year at the very best. So difficult to make a full assessment on that and also difficult when you consider North Melbourne were a pretty average side this year. So assessing Griffin Logue as a key back probably isn't entirely fair. Darcy Tucker played 18 games. He averaged 16 disposals and kicked six goals as a midfielder forward. So I wouldn't say these guys really hit the spot in terms of improving their side in the short term, but they are still young and could potentially by next year, now that Clarkson's back in the box seat again, add something provided that Griffin Logue makes a speedy recovery. Fingers crossed. Then there's the Western Bulldogs who recruited uh, Rory Lobb and Liam Jones as a free agent. Obviously, Liam Jones was for free and played a solid role down back for them, uh, playing 18 game for him. Considering the Bulldogs probably had some need for reinforcement, I'd say that's been a pretty sound uh, acquisition considering as well the price. Rory Lobb, by contrast, he cost pick 30 and a future second round pick to get him off of Fremantle, played 20 games for a return of 24 goals. So nothing really spectacular, averaging just over one goal a game. There were times where he would chop out in the ruck. I think he averaged like seven hitouts a game or something like that. But predominantly as a four, that output isn't spectacular. Uh, it does come after a career best season for Fremantle kicking 36 goals. So I don't think Rory Lobb quite hit the mark 
this season. But at the end of the day, they didn't give up a first round draft pick for him. So maybe it's a solid result. You tell me. Hawthorne had a couple of half decent acquisitions as well in Carl Amon through free agency from Port Adelaide and then Lloyd Meek as part of the Jago O'Meara deal as well. Carl Amon played 21 games, uh, averaged 23 disposals. As a free agent, I think this move looks pretty good. Obviously, they shed some midfield experience. Amon adds, you know, not only a bit of outside class and polish, which they perhaps lacked, but also some experience as well. And he did rank 11th in the league for meters gain. So I'd say that one has been pretty successful for the Hawks. Meek, on the other hand, uh, along with a second rounder, came for Jago O'Meara. He played 16 games, averaging about 18 hitouts. This is really his first crack in a side uh, regularly. Obviously, he was behind Sean Darcy at Fremantle. He's 25. His best football is still ahead of him. So hard to make a real assessment, but he had some big games this year. I think he had 46 hitouts against the Saints. So still a long-term one. I'd say it was a pretty solid return for both Amon and Meek. Let's talk about Blake Akers, who joined Carlton, and this one was a real bargain. He only cost them a future third round pick. He played every game this year for the Blues, averaging 23 disposals uh, a game, and also had a very, very good uh, semi final where he kicked the winning goal as well. I think the fact that he added consistency this year and the fact he's only 27, this is looking like a great acquisition for the Blues at the price he cost. Obviously, Fremantle couldn't really afford with Luke Jackson coming in to give Akers what he was worth, and Carlton have really benefited from that. So, Blake Akers has been successful. Essendon uh, also recruited Will Setterfield and Sam Wiedemann, so a couple of cheap bargain basement uh you know, acquisitions for them. Setterfield was basically for free. It was Settlefield and 68 for a future fourth. He only played 10 games, but I do think in the 10 games we saw, we saw the best version of Will Settlefield probably that I've seen as a big bodied midfielder, averaging about 21 disposals a game before he was struck down with a foot fracture, which sucks. Sam Wiedemann and a few late picks came at the cost of pick 37. So a little bit more expensive. He played 16 games for 15 goals at Essendon, which is an, an amazing return. He was obviously a top 10 pick back in the day. And Essendon really lacked tall forward options. So he did provide them some depth, I suppose, with Peter Wright out of the side for so long. And there was a bag of five against the Cats, but there was a seven-game stretch where Sam Wiedemann didn't kick a goal, and he was subsequently dropped after that. So nothing really special, but considering the cost, uh, wasn't too bad going. We'll talk about Jaden Hunt, who joined West Coast Eagles as an unrestricted free agent. At the time, this one seemed a little bit quirky, considering the age profile. West Coast entering a rebuild and getting a 28-year-old or 27-year-old at the time running defender slash wingman, but this one actually came with a lot of success um, you know he plays fourth in the best and fairest played 23 games so he was durable which was very valuable to West Coast this year and added a lot in their running carry and I would argue West Coast moved to a little bit of a faster game plan was this was probably a move with that in mind he's seen as a bit of a catalyst perhaps for the Eagles trying to adapt despite his age he won't be there for the next premiership window but an outstanding first season from Jaden Hunt considering it was a bad year for the Eagles we'll rattle off some of the smaller deals uh, done at the end of last year as well Ben Long and Tom Berry joined the Gold Coast Suns Long and a future fourth came for pick third 32, and he played 15 games at about 11 disposals a game. So, yeah, pretty solid. Uh, Barry was also involved in a mix of picks, which gave the Lions more points for Will Ashcroft last year, but again, a pretty cheap player. Played six games, subbed off three times, averaged six disposals, no goals as well. So not a great first season from Tom Berry at the Gold Coast Suns. I'm not even sure he's going to survive. Just to be clear, he's not going to die. I just mean, does he have a contract? I don't know. Toby Bedford joined the Giants last year as well, which actually I would argue was pretty successful. Traded for pick 44. Played 19 games for 13 disposals, kicked 12 goals as a forward this year. And he played in all three finals. So I think if you're playing in your side's three finals that obviously indicates his ranking in their squad so for pick 44 Bedford was a pretty good pickup Aaron Francis was made for a token swap of 37 for 42 and a future fourth he played in 15 games this year he was the sub three times an unused sub in their final game before the finals he wasn't picked in the finals so considering the cost can't really mark Sydney down for that or anything like that and he had a solid season but uh, Aaron Francis's career probably trending in the wrong direction and finally there's Zane Cordy from St Kilda I think this is the last play that moved clubs last year, uh, moved as an unrestricted free agent, played 14 games, kicked seven goals as mostly a defender and played a bit forward as well. He was in their side that played in the elimination final, which they, of course, lost as well. So you'd argue unrestricted free agent, can't be on a massive contract, um, relatively successful first season, but obviously not a huge playmaker for the Saints, let's be honest. But anyway, guys, that is me rattling off all the players that switched clubs last year. Let me know if there's anyone I missed. I did include all the free agents and everyone that was traded. I don't think I picked up any delisted free agents as well. But as always, I welcome your thoughts and comments in the comments section below. Make sure you subscribe to the channel if you haven't already, and I'll see you in the next one. Cheers.